we are thrilled to be able to talk about eating disorders today. It's a really important topic. Um, and I want to introduce you to our presenter, Liz Altamkara. She's the Director of Education at the National Eating Disorders Association. And we're so delighted that she's here with us today. So today we're going to be talking about eating disorders. And again, thank you so much for talking about this important issue. We should be talking more about eating disorders to raise awareness, because unfortunately there are a lot of misconceptions about this. Uh, so today's uh, presentation is just going to be an overview of eating disorders. Let's talk about what eating disorders are. So eating disorders are real life-threatening illnesses with potentially fatal consequences. So they are life-threatening, so they are very serious issues, and they involve extreme emotions, attitudes, and behaviors surrounding weight, food, and size. And they are caused by a range of biological, psychological, and sociocultural factors. We refer to eating disorders as biopsychosocial issues because they arise from the combination of these three factors. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about it throughout this presentation, but that's something to keep in mind. So the other question is, who do eating disorders affect? And the answer is everyone. People of all genders, ages, races, religions, ethnicities, sexual orientations, body shapes, and weights can be affected. And usually, you know, when we talk about eating disorders, there's a stereotypical image that comes to mind. And people usually think about young females, affluent females that may get affected by eating disorders. But we know that that's not true. We know that eating disorders don't discriminate and anybody can get affected. And this is a really important point that we are trying to raise awareness around because not knowing that eating disorders don't discriminate can really have serious consequences in terms of treatment, access to treatment, access to care. So this is really important. And based on the research studies and, you know, like surveys and everything, it is estimated that 9% of the U.S. population or 28.8 .8 million Americans will have an eating disorders in their lifetime. And this is diagnosed eating disorders. And there are a lot more people who may be experiencing undiagnosed eating disorders or maybe experiencing disordered eating behaviors that can at some point turn into an eating disorder. So I already mentioned that they are biopsychosocial disorders, so let's talk a little bit about what they mean. So an eating disorder is a psychosocial disorder, and there is th that bio component in there as well. So they are, you know, it's a mental illness caused or influenced by life experiences and maladjusted cognitive and behavioral processes. So what does this mean in terms of biologically? What are some biological factors that may put a person at risk to develop an eating disorders? So there's definitely family history in there, meaning if you have someone in your family who's already struggled or diagnosed with an eating disorder, you have a higher risk to develop an eating disorder. Uh, there is history of dieting. Unfortunately, dieting has become so normalized in our society that we, we don't really think twice about it, but it really does have detrimental effects on health, and it can also put someone potentially at risk for an eating disorder. And the other one is type 1 diabetes and lots of genetic predisposition. So there are people genetically predisposed to develop an eating disorder. And in terms of psychological factors, having low self-esteem, body image dissatisfaction, feelings of inadequacy or depression, anxiety, fear or loneliness, those are all the psychological factors that may put someone at risk for an eating disorder. And social factors. So those are really cultural norms that overvalue appearance that drive for perceived ideal body type. And those are all the messages that we are bombarded by the media and social media in general. There is this, you know, idealistic view of appearance that everybody's trying to achieve. So that's why as an organization, we are always here to celebrate body diversity. You know, we all come from different genes. So it's important to remember that, you know, everybody is beautiful and there are different types of bodies. And the other component of this social factors is historical trauma, as well as weight stigma and bullying. They can also contribute to develop an eating disorder. And as I said, unfortunately, there are a lot of misconceptions around eating disorders. And, you know, that's why there are nine truths about eating disorders that we would like the public to know. And the first one is many people with eating disorders look healthy, yet may be extremely ill. For this reason, we always say you cannot really tell if a person is struggling with an eating disorder by just looking at them. So that's why it's really important to create a safe environment for them and an open communication for them 
so that they can disclose their issues. And usually eating disorders are very secretive. You know, usually the person who is engaging in this disordered eating behaviors, they already feel ashamed of the behaviors that they're engaging in. So it may be difficult for them to open up. And the second truth is families are not to blame and can be the patients and providers best allies in treatments. And for years, there has been this misconception that families is the reason why a person is struggling with an eating disorder is the family, like the way they were raised or, you know, like the parents are doing something wrong that, that is leading this person to an eating disorder. We know that's not true. And we also know that support is really important and essential in recovery. And for this reason, educating the, the parents or the guardians or the family, the support system around eating disorders is really crucial in eating disorder recovery. And the third truth is an eating disorder diagnosis is a health crisis that's, that disrupts personal and family functioning. And that's also really important to remember. It doesn't really just affect the person. It really affects the whole family and the whole social network of the person because there are many elements to eating disorders, the isolation, the mood swings, you know, we're going to talk more about the signs and symptoms, but this is really something that affects the whole system. And that's why we always say support is really essential in recovery. So the fourth truth is eating disorders are not choices, but serious biologically influenced illnesses. The other misconception is that people kind of engage in disordered eating behaviors because they are trying to get attention. Or some parents may think that eating disorders are just a phase and, you know, kids are going to grow out of it. So we know that's not true. We know like nobody chooses to have a potentially fatal disorder. So that's really important to keep in mind, especially to be able to remove the stigma around eating disorders. And the other one, and I have already told you this, but I'm going to repeat again, eating disorders affect people of all genders, ages, races, ethnicities, body shapes and weight, sexual orientation and socioeconomic statuses. And the sixth truth is eating disorders carry an increased risk for both suicide and medical complications. We're going to be talking a little bit about this, but there are a lot of co-occurring illnesses with eating disorders. So they occur at the same time as an eating disorder and, you know, self-harming behavior, suicidal ideation, and some other psychological mental illnesses can also happen co-occur with an eating disorder. The seventh truth is genes and environment play important roles in the development of eating disorders. So this is really the bio and the social, socio aspect that we talked about. You know, biologically, your genes, your heritage plays a role, as well as the social environment, the diet culture that we are all immersed in. And number eight is genes alone do not predict who will develop eating disorders. And there have been some twin studies, some identical twin studies that have been done on. So really, like from based on your genes, you may be predisposed to have an eating disorder, but based on your environment and the culture and the society that you, you are in, you may not end up having an eating disorder or you may end up having an eating disorder. So that's why that social component is really important. And those, this is some of the things that we are trying to do by raising awareness, by working with social media companies, trying to really change the, this idealistic appearance that we are all exposed to. And finally, you know, full recovery from an eating disorder is possible and early detection and intervention are important. Yes, they are very serious. Yes, they can potentially be fatal. However, we believe that full recovery is possible with the right help and support. And, you know, one thing that we always say, since they are such complex illnesses, we always recommend to seek help from a provider or treatment facility that specializes in eating disorder. And sometimes it may be tricky to find those. And, you know, there are a lot of other issues that may prevent people from seeking help. This could be financial issues or insurance issues. However, it, it is really important to get help from a professional who specialize in eating disorders. And there's also the prevention piece. Uh, they are preventable. And for this reason, there are certain evidence-based programs that can be used to prevent e eating disorders from happening in the first place. Let's talk a little bit about warning signs, symptoms, and health consequences here. Common warning signs. And one thing I want to flag is that even though we talk about, you know, common warning signs, emotional behavior, and physical signs, the experience of an eating disorder is very unique to the person based on their background. You know, those are kind of some general signs that we see. Emotionally and behaviorally, you may notice that weight loss, dieting, and control of food are becoming primary concerns for the person. 
you may see the person engaging in food rituals. You may see that they may become socially withdrawn from their family or friends. Uh, you may notice that they're frequently dieting and also they are frequently checking their bodies in front of the mirror. And you may also notice some extreme mood swings. And physically, you'll see some noticeable weight fluctuations. Again, this is not true for everyone, but you know, sometimes that what we see and gastrointestinal complaints, dizziness upon standing, difficulty concentrating or sleeping, and issues with dental, skin, hair, and nail health. And depending on the type of eating disorders, the symptoms may vary as well, but this is kind of generally what we see in a person who is experiencing an eating disorder. And I like to talk about the diagnosis. So, you know, therapists and physicians, medical professionals use DSM-5. So that's really the diagnostic manual to be able to diagnose mental illnesses. So these, these are the categories that we currently have in DSM-5. The first one is anorexia nervosa, and anorexia nervosa is the eating disorders where the person is engaging in restrictive eating patterns. So they restrict the amount of calories that they take in. Then bulimia nervosa. Bulimia nervosa is marked by periods of binge eating, so consuming large amounts of food in a short period of time, and then engage in purging behavior, like trying to get rid of the food that they've consumed by vomiting, by using laxatives, or by exercising, over-exercising. Then there is binge eating disorder, or BED, and binge eating disorder is similar to bulimia, where the person consumes large amount of food in a short amount of time, but they don't engage in purging behaviors. Uh, then there is another one that we are talking a lot about these days. It's called ARFID or Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. This used to be a diagnosis only for children, but we know that people of all ages suffer from this disorder. This is really, again, restrictive eating, but the person doesn't really have that body image component. So they are not really concerned about the way they look but they may limit their food intake based off the texture, based, you know, they can only eat maybe some food groups and avoid the others. And as you can imagine, this can really create a lot of issues for the person's health. And if it's a child, you may also see some developmental issues. And then we have other specified feeding or eating disorders or OSFED, basically any other eating issue that doesn't fit into one of these categories. It's important to emphasize that they are as serious as the other diagnoses. And also eating disorders are complex and some eating issues will not meet the diagnostic criteria. However, all must be taken seriously. So that's why we are always say it's really important to learn about signs and symptoms so that you can intervene before the disordered eating patterns turn into a full one eating disorder. We already mentioned co-occurring disorders. So, uh, you know, these are other issues that happen at the same time as an eating disorder and they have a high prevalence rate and they can intensify eating disorder symptoms and impact treatments in terms of recovery, level of care or drop out. And some of the most common comorbidities are mood disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use, and currently, if you're familiar with our social media, we've been doing a campaign on substance use and eating disorders since April is Alcohol Awareness Month. This has high prevalence rate with eating disorders, and it's important to be aware of this issue. And lastly, an important point is that treatment should address coexisting conditions and eating disorders. So it is really important to find a provider or treatment facilities that are addressing both the co-occurrence and the eating disorder. Since, you know, as mentioned here, they can really intensify eating disorder symptoms. So the professionals and experts really say that it's not a good idea, let's say, to treat the eating disorder first and then to tackle substance use. It really has to be done at the same time. So it's really important to find those facilities that can help the person with both issues. And in terms of health consequences, unfortunately, eating disorders affect every system in the body. They can affect, affect the heart. They can have cardiovascular com consequences like muscle loss low or irregular heartbeat. They can have some GI consequences like bloating, nausea, constipation. They can have neurological health consequences like difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping or sleep apnea. 
and they can have endocrinological consequences, consequences around hormones, like hormonal changes in terms of estrogen, testosterone, and thyroid. And let's talk about how to find support and resources. So one thing is we have an eating disorder screening tool on our website, and our website is nationalleadingdisorders.org. So it's a very quick screening tool. It only takes three minutes or so, and it is a tool that can help determine if it's time to seek professional help. So it's not a diagnostic tool. It's just a screening tool, but we find that, you know, some people really find it validating taking the screening and kind of understanding that they are really struggling with something that's real. You know, we hear from people that say, I always thought it's in my head. You know, as I said, since dieting and all these issues have been so normalized in our society for some and for some people, they've been struggling with these issues for such a long time that they may not even notice that they are struggling with a mental illness. So that's why, you know, we encourage anyone who thinks they may be suffering to take the screening tool. And participants who are screened as at risk will be directed to NIDA's helpline and other resources for, for support and uh, treatment options. And the other resource that we have is our toolkits. We have toolkits are on our website. There are comprehensive resources that are available that can be downloaded directly from the website. Uh, currently, we are in the process of updating the whole website as well as our resources. So you'll see that in the fall towards winter, we'll have new resources available. But currently, we have an educator toolkit for school staff because we believe that especially for children, teachers and educators are at a place where they can recognize some signs and the symptoms of an eating disorders and can help the family get the child help. So we have a lot of information in this toolkit. We have a parent toolkit. It's called parent toolkit, but it's really a resource for anyone who has a loved one struggling with an eating disorder. It gives an overview of an eating disorder. Then it answers questions about insurance, about recovery, treatments, and everything you need to know about eating disorders. And finally, we have a coach and athletic trainer toolkit. Uh, we know that athletes are at higher risk for to develop an eating disorder. And in the same way as educator, coaches, and trainers, they're at a point where they may be able to see the warning signs earlier sometimes than the family. So for this reason, we have some information for them in this toolkit. And you see the link to access the toolkits on the slide. And next, I want to talk a little bit about how to help a loved one who may be affected by an eating disorders. And first, let's talk about what to do. The first is really to learn as much as you can about eating disorders. As I said, since there are so many misconceptions, it's important to know what they really are. And the second one, it's important to be honest and vocal about your concerns. Some people wait just thinking that these issues are going to go away. But as we said, they are not phases. So it's really important to talk about your concern. And we always suggest to use eye language instead of kind of saying, oh, you've been, you, you haven't been eating or you've been going to the bathroom after every meal. Try to use eye language. Say, I've noticed that you've been, you know, disappearing after meals. I'm concerned so that you really want to create this judgment-free environment when you're approaching someone who may be affected by these issues. Uh, be caring and firm and suggest seeking help from a physician and or therapist. So the treatment of an eating disorder is usually multidisciplinary. So you will usually see a team of professionals who are supporting the patient. And this consists of a physician, a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, a therapist, and a nutritionist. So suggest person to seek help. Like they can start anywhere. Seeing a physician, a therapist, or a nutritionist is always a good first step. And also be a good role model. Practice what you preach. You know, as I said, if you're telling your friend or your loved one to stop restricting, however, if you're engaging in restriction and diets, so then that that's that's not being a good role model. You know, so that's something else, some something important to do. And when you're trying to help, I want to talk about some things what not to do. You know, place shame, blame, or guilt. This is really important. As I said, these people are usually ashamed of the behaviors that they're engaging in. So that's important. And also don't make any rules or promises that you cannot or will not uphold. Like, don't worry, I'm not going to tell anyone. You know, those are the things that you shouldn't promise. 
promise because in the end you may need to tell someone especially if they're struggling with some of the comorbidities like self-harm or suicidal ideation that we talked about before do not give simplistic solutions like oh just eat or just stop you know stop binging things like that we know those are complex and these are not going to be helpful or do not invalidate their experience or try to convince. You know, this is the person lived experience and that this is what we are trying to do at NIDA as well. Uh, we know that lived experiences really are gonna guide us in terms of finding the, finding the support and treatment for these people. So just listen and don't invalidate or trying to convince. Or do not give advice about weight, exercise or appearance. I, I feel like this is, this should apply to everyone, not just like if you have a person who is affected by eating disorders. And again, this has been so normalized. I mean, even on the media every day, you know, we hear about people judging celebrities, you know, body image or body type. It's been so common and so normal, but this can really have some negative consequences on the person's self-esteem, body dissatisfaction, and ultimately lead to an eating disorder. And lastly, don't ignore or avoid the situation until it is severe or life-threatening. Say something, we should be talking about these issues you know, the person is really, most of the times, is not going to take the first step to open up and talk about these issues. So that's why it's important to set up a private space to be able to discuss your concerns with your loved one. And when we are talking about eating disorders, there are a few things that is important to keep in mind because some of the things that we may say may be triggering to the person who is affected by the eating disorders. So we try not to provide tips or play the numbers game. When we say play the numbers game, like do not use numbers for weight or height. That could be really triggering. And some people like eating disorders love, love comparing. People may compare their weight loss or their body size to the others. So we try to get away from that. And these are also the tips that we share with the media. Like when media members approach us and they tell us we want to cover content around eating disorders, we tell them the same thing. You know, don't use numbers when you're writing about eating disorders. Also, you know, emphasize the seriousness of eating disorders without, without portraying them as hopeless. Yes, eating disorders are serious. Yes, they can be fatal. However, we know that for recovery is possible with the right help and support. The goal is really to connect the person with the right support and professional help. And watch out for the appearance ideal. And this is again, referring to the image that we see in our society, in the media that everybody is trying to attain, which is usually, you, you know, this unrealistic body proportions, unrealistic body weight. And don't focus on images or descriptions of the body at its unhealthiest point. And this, this is another recommendation that we have for people who are sharing their own experiences of recovery. Sometimes, you know, they tend to focus on images or descriptions of the body when they were unhealthy. So those before and after photos, so th those could be really triggering for those who are experiencing an eating disorder. And lastly, if you're interested, we encourage everybody to get involved with NIDA. I mean, first, please feel free to visit our website at nationaleatingdisorders.org. As I said, very soon we are updating our website and we're going to be having a resource center in the website for those who are affected by eating disorders. But currently we have a lot of information on eating disorder, treatment, body image recovery, and we also have a lot of volunteer opportunities. We have walks all over the country. So walks are really community building events. We like to bring people together who are affected by eating disorders to celebrate recovery and to support each other. It's important for people to know that they are not alone in this journey. And we have a new initiative called Campus Warriors. We know that eating disorders don't like transitions, meaning transitions are really a hard time for those who are experiencing disordered eating or an eating disorder. And starting college is a major transition in a young adult's life. For this reason, we are trying to create like mini NIDAs, you know, across college campuses in the US. So we are encouraging college students to get involved and raise awareness on their campuses. And we also have additional volunteer opportunities like creating content for our blog or social media. So you can go to nationaleatingdisorders.org to learn more. Number is also our administrative number. If you have any questions, you can always call this number or you can also send an email to info at mynida.org.